Good morning. Thank you. The famous uh, prairie author, W.O. Mitchell, uh, once wrote a book titled, Who Has Seen the Wind? And I know, I guess I have. And sometimes I fear it. Sometimes I try to control it. But I'm always very, very respectful of the power of the wind. You see, as was introduced, I'm a, uh, a sports aerodynamicist. What I do is take a wind tunnel and the principles of fluid dynamics and try to reduce the aerodynamic drag on an athlete. Now, why is that important? Well, it turns out that as an athlete moves through the air, the air creates resistance to that movement. The faster you move, the greater the resistance. So to double one's speed requires eight times the power. Now, for an athlete already working at their top limit, they simply can't produce any more power. The only way they can go faster is if we reduce the resistance. So what kinds of athletes are interested in going faster? Well, speed skaters are, and so are cyclists and, and skeleton racers. And over the last few years, I've worked with a number of these athletes. I've observed how they achieve their goals. And what I'd like to share with you today are some ideas that can help us to achieve our goals in any endeavor that we're involved in, not just sports. So the idea is that we can use the methods used by Olympians to achieve their goals to help us to achieve our goals. Now, I think most of us would agree that winning a gold medal is the pinnacle of human achievement. It's like having everyone in the world write an exam where only one person passes. Mathematically or statistically, the chances of winning a gold medal are about 22 million to one. It's phenomenal. So if we're gonna try and be as successful as an Olympic medalist, we have to put ourselves in their place for a moment. So let me transport you to the top of the Whistler Sliding Center. It's February 19th, 2010. It's the final run of the men's skeleton competition. You are in second position right now. You're 18 one hundredths of a second from the gold medal. 18 one hundredths, a blink of the eye. It's so close you can taste it. But you have one more run to do. If you have a great run, you'll win the gold medal. A bad run, four more years, you'll have to wait for Olympic glory. So, let's go to the start line. The horn sounds, you get on your, start pushing your sled, you're sprinting along, you reach your maximum velocity, jump on the sled, head first, aerodynamic position, and your chin is just millimeters from that ice. At that point, the track takes over. It suddenly accelerates you until you're going 140 kilometers an hour. You're also feeling the effects of five times gravity. And it is very, very loud. It is also unforgiving. If you enter that first corner just five centimeters, two inches, too soon, your line will be wrong. You'll hit the next corner too low and you'll bounce back and forth like a pinball all the way down the track, exponentially losing time and ruining your metal potential. But in this case, you've been good and lucky and you've moved into the top position. There's one competitor left. Now all you can do is wait and hope. Now, that was the position that Russell Manitoba's John Montgomery found himself in just a short year ago. And it's said, you know, that luck is the meeting of preparation and opportunity. Well, in this case, John was a very lucky individual. He had selected a sport that Canadians excel at. He had 
a home field advantage. He had excellent coaching, and he had had significant training time on a difficult track. So John had an opportunity for greatness, but he had also prepared for that moment to a degree that few of us would ever consider in our everyday endeavors. And to my mind, it's that level of preparation that permits the success that an Olympic athlete has and also the lack of that preparation which leads to the failures we sometimes have in our own endeavors. So what I would like to do is share with you some of the steps that Olympians take to reach their goals. But I want you to apply these steps to your own lives. So the first thing is to set a goal. For an Olympian, it's very simple. They want to be the best. They want to win a gold medal. For you or me, it might be excelling on an exam, running the local 10K in, a, in your fastest time ever, or acing a job interview. So once we have our goal, what we need to do now is prepare. Now, at the Olympic level, most people have only a dim concept of how hard it is and how much time is involved in training. As an example, Lance Armstrong, seven-time Tour de France winner, he was famous for training six hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. In that training, he would do several stages of the Tour de France, the most difficult ones, Alpe d'Huez, Tourmaine, etc., several times before the event, so that when the actual race occurred, there were no surprises. So his, his success was very closely tied to his level of preparation. Now, to allow someone to train that hard, they have to have a support team. It starts with a coach, but you also need a strength and conditioning coach. You need a massage therapist, a physiotherapist, a sports psychologist, a nutritionist, even a chef. You know, these days, an Olympic performance is really not an individual performance. It's the culmination of the efforts of all that support team. And in recognition of, the, of that importance, the Canadian government funded the Own the Podium program before the 2010 Olympics, so that as many Canadian athletes as possible would have the resources and support that they needed to be successful. Now, beyond that, I've found that successful athletes have an incredible ability to focus on the task at hand. When I bring an athlete into the wind tunnel, they can be jovial, they can be talkative, they're having a good time. They're not really having to work too hard here physically. But if I say to them, okay, pretend you're on the starting line, boom, they change, the game face comes on. Their muscles tense, they become silent, they become incredibly focused. They block out everything else. Their eyes become like laser beams through their visors. They're ready for their event. Now, another fantastic example of focus is Canada's Joni Rochette. She was recently selected Canada's Female Athlete of the Year. You may recall that just two days before her Olympic performance at the 2010 Games, her mother passed away quite unexpectedly. Despite this enormous personal tragedy, she was able to block out everything else, focus on her performance, and she had an incredible and inspiring performance that led to a bronze medal. So at the elite level, having um, incredible focus is so critical for success. But having said that, I have to admit that at the elite level, all athletes train, they all have support, and they all focus. And so the differences in performance are very small. And that is where the application of technology can make a difference. Now let me just give you an example of how small the differences are. I recently compiled some statistics on the difference between the gold and silver performances in 24 pure speed events, not judged events, pure speed events where time made the difference. What did I find? 
the average margin of victory was 0.28%, a quarter of 1%. Most astoundingly, six events were won by less than eight one-hundredths of a second. At that level, your equipment can determine whether you succeed or fail. So at that level, that's where we start taking people into the wind tunnel. There is no detail too small. We like to say that everything is significant. And if we can shave a little bit of drag off of them, we may be able to give them enough to win. So let me give you some examples. You may remember that the women's bobsleigh teams from Canada came first and second in Vancouver. Well, four months before the games, three of the four athletes on those sleds were in the wind tunnel practicing their positioning and their equipment, seeing what worked best, what had the lowest drag. What did we find? Well, simply removing some decals and some rough spots from the helmet on the, lead, on the driver would knock the drag down of the whole sled by almost 2%. That equated to six one-hundredths of a second on one run. On a four-run event, it's over two-tenths of a second, and that's tremendously uh, significant. In snowboard cross, we had one athlete draft behind the other because they're passing all the time as they go down the course. And so it's important for them to know which side of the athlete they want to pass they should go by on, where they should sit in the draft, where it reduces their energy expenditure. So doing that and also reducing the size of their pants, making them tighter, reducing the size of their helmets. Well, what was the effect? Mayel Ricker, first Canadian woman to win a gold medal on home soil. Now, what about John Montgomery? Well, John spent four years, several days over four years, in the wind tunnel. It's a cold, uncomfortable place. But he did it because it could make the difference. And what he found was that very small changes in his positioning, his clothing, his helmet, all these things could incrementally reduce his drag. So for example, putting a strip of very smooth tape on the front of his sled reduced the sled drag by about 4%. Reducing his helmet size, one size, reduced the helmet drag by about 13.5%. And so what was the effect, the net effect, of all those small changes? just enough speed to give him seven one-hundredths of a second and the gold medal. So, in summary, what I think athletes can teach us is that success is a process. We need to set a goal. We've talked about um, acing an exam, running a good 10K, having a wonderful job interview. Having done that, we need to commit to training. We have to study. We have to run on weekends. We have to practice our job interview skills. We have to organize a support team so that, you know, you need, a, you need a tutor, you need a coach, you need a job recruiter to help you with those things. You have to stay focused. And finally, for that last 1% or 5%, you need to utilize technology. Perhaps it's using the internet to help your study. Perhaps it's using a heart rate monitor to train more effectively for your race. Or perhaps, in the case of doing a, a resume, it's using a spell checker to make sure you don't have even one spelling mistake. Because that one spelling mistake may preclude you from getting that job interview. So everything is significant in all of these. Now, a short time ago, Alex Billadu who was Canada's first athlete to win a gold medal on home soil, was asked what he had learned from his Olympic experience. And it was really interesting what he had to say. He said, what I think my experience taught me, and hopefully Canadians, is that there are no limits to what can be accomplished with hard work, sacrifice, and the right resources. Thanks very much.